In part one of this series, we saw Rex Patrick, the independent senator, requesting National Cabinet documents from Scott Morrison. His request was rejected because the government claimed that National Cabinet is a committee of the federal cabinet. Senator Patrick took action and the case ended up in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. There is much more background in part one, but this video is focused on the case itself and the decision by federal court judge Justice White. It's an 85 page judgment, so I'm only gonna cover the main points. And by the way, it doesn't end here. Scott Morrison is too salty about this decision and what he's trying to do now as a result is ridiculous. Scott Morrison's argument boiled down to two points. First, that National Cabinet is a committee of the cabinet and therefore exempt from FOI laws and that releasing these documents would be against the public interest. Let's deal with the first point. Is National Cabinet part of Federal Cabinet? The government's argument is based on the exemption provided to cabinet documents under Section 34 of the Freedom of Information Act. The judge goes through all the arguments from both sides to determine whether this is actually the case. First, the general meaning of a cabinet of the committee is explored. The judge says that the mere use of the name National Cabinet doesn't automatically make a group of people a committee of the cabinet. Even though the Prime Minister doesn't get to decide the statutory meaning of the term cabinet, his own handbook says that cabinet is the council of senior ministers who are empowered by the government to take binding decisions on its behalf. And a committee of that cabinet is taken to mean a subgroup of cabinet itself, not a group of external persons. The government couldn't provide any evidence to show that a committee of the cabinet could be comprised mainly of people who were not themselves ministers of the federal government. Not only did national cabinet have only one member of federal cabinet, which was the prime minister, the other members didn't even belong to the same government, let alone the same political party. In other words, the judge made it pretty clear that to be a committee of the cabinet, the members of that committee needed to be, for the most part, members of the federal cabinet. Another point Scott Morrison tried to argue was that an essential feature of a cabinet committee is that he establishes them. And because he had established national cabinet, then it was also a cabinet committee. Even if it was the case that the Prime Minister established National Cabinet, that in itself doesn't say anything. That would mean any committee set up by the Prime Minister could be called a Cabinet Committee and therefore its documents would be secret. The judge called this premise unsound. The other issue of course was that the evidence showed that it wasn't the Prime Minister that set up National Cabinet at all. Remember COAG, the group that the National Cabinet has now replaced? The evidence the government itself provided contradicted their own claim and confirmed that COAG was the one that made the decision to establish National Cabinet. So there goes that argument. The government then tries another point. The Cabinet Handbook says that the Prime Minister is responsible for the membership of Cabinet Committees and has complete control of the membership. This, they argued, is what happened with National Cabinet. They even said that the membership in the National Cabinet was the Prime Minister's gift you have to give it to them, at least they're being creative. Except even here, all the evidence shows that this isn't the case. The judge made it clear that each member of National Cabinet is there because they hold a certain position, so a Premier for example. They aren't there because they were handpicked by the Prime Minister. And there was no evidence that Scott Morrison actually appointed any of the members. The government also provided evidence which showed that members could then delegate to other ministers within their respective governments to attend National Cabinet on their behalf. Again, there was nothing to say that they needed the Prime Minister's permission. So it was clear then that the Prime Minister didn't have absolute power as to the membership of the National Cabinet. I like how so many of these points are shut down by the government's own evidence. So then the government brought out the big guns. They said, Look at all these other historical examples where non-cabinet members have been part of a cabinet committee. For example, they argued that during World War II, Prime Minister Curtin had a war cabinet to which they invited state premiers. Except, unsurprisingly, the evidence didn't support this. All the members of the war cabinets were in fact ministers of the federal government. And while state premiers were invited to attend just one meeting, they were not invited as members. So the judge rejected that historical examples gave any credibility to the government's arguments. 
Then the tribunal considered a really important point, the interrelationship between the national cabinet and the federal cabinet. Now the handbook notes that cabinet committees derive their power from cabinet itself and that they need to report back to cabinet for endorsement of decisions and their decisions can be overridden. On the back of that, Scott Morrison argued that National Cabinet's entire role was to assist the Federal Cabinet in making appropriate decisions. That's a big claim and suggests that National Cabinet is just an extension of the Federal Cabinet's decision-making powers. So the judge examined the evidence. He pointed to a press conference from the Prime Minister on the 5th of May 2020. Well, I can't preempt decisions of Friday. The, the National Cabinet, particularly on these issues, where the Commonwealth has no direct authority at all, our job here is to try and ensure as much consistency across state and territory uh, jurisdictions as possible. Each state and territory are the arbiters of, of their own position. The Tribunal said that this made it clear that the Prime Minister's view was that the National Cabinet addressed some matters which the federal government had no responsibility over. The judge also pointed out a number of other flaws with this argument. There was no evidence that National Cabinet had been asked to assist Federal Cabinet, that decisions weren't taken back to the Federal Cabinet for endorsement, that the ultimate power of decisions wasn't held by Federal Cabinet, that Federal Cabinet wasn't briefed on decisions, nor did it have the power to alter a decision, and that National Cabinet addressed matters which were outside of the federal jurisdiction. It's fair to say that argument was completely rejected. So the government started to then clutch at straws. According to them, the Cabinet Handbook says that the Cabinet Secretary manages the administrative side of Cabinet committees. And because the government had provided administrative support to the National Cabinet, it was therefore a committee of Cabinet. Even though it was clear that states and territories also provided administrative support, the judge did accept this point. He said, I accept that this is consistent with the National Cabinet being a committee of the Cabinet, but do not regard it as a strong indicator that that is so. Imagine if this argument had weight. To make everything secret, all Scott Morrison would need to do would be to send the Cabinet Secretary to every single government agency meeting. Sorted. Another minor point. The government argued that because National Cabinet was subject to confidentiality as part of its own rules, then that's the same as a Cabinet committee. I mean, more straws being clutched. Obviously, a lot of agencies want their meetings to be confidential, but that's not how democracy works, and not how freedom of information works. So basically, not a strong indicator of anything. The government tried one final argument. Remember in part one, I talked about collective responsibility being an important feature of Cabinet? Specifically, that the decisions bound all the members. Scott Morrison claimed that National Cabinet operated on these same principles. Except, again, the evidence showed that this wasn't the case. The judge referred to the press conference from the 5th of May 2020. We're a federation, and at the end of the day, states have sovereignty over decisions that fall specifically within their domain. This confirmed that the states and territories could make their own decisions and were not accountable to the federal parliament. And so after all that, it was pretty clear that the judge thought that the arguments point persuasively against the national cabinet being a committee of the cabinet. So then we come to the second part of the argument. Remember, there were two reasons the government gave the judge to avoid the release of documents. First, that national cabinet is a committee of cabinet, and that argument got destroyed. And then second, that it is against the public interest. Basically, the public interest argument is taken from Section 11A, Subsection 5 of the Freedom of Information Act. And the reason the government said it would be contrary to the public interest is that it would damage relations between the Commonwealth and the states. This is a balancing act to figure out if, on balance, there would be damage caused. The government argued that releasing the documents would cause damage to the relationship between the Commonwealth and states because the discussions would no longer be confidential and the members of National Cabinet would be hesitant to act in a certain way if there was public oversight. So what did the tribunal say? First, it clearly said that undermining the confidentiality of National Cabinet didn't mean that damage had been done to Commonwealth and state relations. They are two separate concerns. More interestingly, the government's own evidence was that releasing the documents would show the discussions underpinning the decisions that were made disclose which premier supported what measure, 
which Premier opposed certain things, and so on. But this should be no surprise by now. Those giving evidence probably hadn't even looked at the documents in question. The tribunal pointed out that the documents didn't record the motion of the meetings, nor did they record any of the discussions that preceded agreements. Not only did the documents just list out the final outcomes, but many were then publicly announced by the Prime Minister himself in press conferences. He obviously wasn't concerned about damaging the relationship between Commonwealth and states. So no, the tribunal didn't think that releasing the documents would be contrary to the public interest, and so that argument also failed. And with that, on the 5th of August 2021, the tribunal ordered that Senator Patrick be granted access to the documents he asked for. Last week, Federal Court Justice White ruled that the National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet and is not protected by Cabinet in confidence. The judgment was scathing of the Commonwealth. The tribunal gave the government 28 days to appeal the decision, which they said they would do if they lost. But they didn't. And so these documents were released and Senator Patrick also put in another request for all the other National Cabinet documents that he hadn't initially asked for. But before you celebrate this win for transparency, it's not all over. Because instead of appealing the decision, what Scott Morrison did instead was to rush a new piece of law into Parliament. And I want to cover that in part three.